You're watching another episode of In Studio. I'm Brian Parika, and today we're joined with Derek Lavasser and Chris Mahandi of Investigation Discoveries Breaking Homicide. That was a mouthful, but thanks, for, thanks for coming in. You thanks for coming in. How are you guys doing? It. Great. Thanks for having us. Now, for those who haven't, I guess, watched the series yet, can kind of talk us through it and, and kind of explain like what your backgrounds are that make you qualified to, to open up these cases again and re-examine them. Sure. I'm a clinical police and forensic psychologist. I've been doing this kind of work for over 25 years, and I've interviewed hundreds of offenders who've killed a lot of people, and I've interviewed a lot of victims and looked at a lot of crime scenes, and I've testified in all kinds of murder cases and regularly consult to investigations throughout my career. I was an investigator for 13 years. I spent time in the patrol division, investigative division, special investigations unit. I was undercover for, for three years. Had the opportunity to supervise a couple different task force, work with the FBI, DEA, Secret Service, ATF, and yeah, it was a, it was a good experience. A lot of uh, advanced training and interview and interrogation tactics as well. That's great. Now, in terms of breaking homicide, how did you guys go about like which cases you would re-examine? I know the first one for you was, was a personal one. That was a, you yeah. can talk about that. That was a no-brainer, yeah. This first one was uh, going back to my hometown and working on a case that I've known about for years and just taking a, a fresh look at it with Chris yeah. after doing the OJ series together. Um, I'll let you explain the other yeah, one. Uh, yeah, what happened was we were in the car uh, on the OJ case and Derek said, I got a case you absolutely have to see right. and it was the Michelle Norris case. And so even before this show was even conceived, it was already on Derek's mind, and both of us have a commitment to doing cases that speak to you know, the average person's experience as opposed to something that's you know, some super high profile, you know, celebrity type case, if you will. And what ended up happening as the OJ series rolled out was a number of people reached out to us, and that led us to start taking in cases uh -huh. that you know, viewers were experiencing that they'd had unresolved, and that was how this series was born. Yeah, and as far as selecting, we wanted to go with cases that we felt there was some solvability there, something we could do with the advancement in technology and science that maybe had different from what was done when it, was, when it originally occurred. So we, we went through the list. We picked an, an eclectic group of cases to try to show a range, um, and we wish we could have done more, but we, you know, we went with six for the first season. Now, in the Michelle Norris case, you talk about how Julie had, her mother Julie had reached out to you about, about kind of looking at this case again. Yeah. In terms of the other cases, though, what were the challenges of getting people to reopen these wounds, talk about these cases again? And, well, the idea of reopening... And be, being filmed. Yeah, the idea of reopening yeah. wounds. These victims' families live with this every single day of their lives. Yeah. This is not something that goes away. It may be on a back burner of a police department, not because they don't want to solve it, but yeah. because there's nothing new to help them solve it, and maybe they need a fresh perspective, maybe. But um, for the victims, um, for the families that are wondering what happened, they're living with it every day. Yeah. And so um, they're very interested in getting some answers, and that's how it happened. You know, they, it was some people may not want to go on camera and talk about it, and that's understandable, and that's certainly respected. Um, but there's a lot of people that say, you know, we've tried other things. Let's see what happens. And you, and you will see with all the cases, as you saw, you're going to talk about Hawaii a little yeah. bit, that uh, and for most of these cases, they wanted our help. So they, they, we went there knowing that they, they, this is something they wanted to happen. They wanted to bring a new level of exposure to their, to their loved one's case. So it wasn't too hard to speak with them at all, no. and, for, and for the most part. Were there any cases that you weren't able to kind of re-examine because people didn't want to be involved and be filmed? Or? No, I mean, honestly, we wouldn't have taken a case on that didn't want our help. Okay. It wasn't something where we're like, hey, listen, we're just going to highlight this case and hope we can help without their permission. Either a friend or family member or a community member reached out to us and said, listen, we really think there's something here. Will you help? And that's kind of what this is. Investigation Discovery has been receiving calls from their audiences and emails from their audiences for years saying, will you help us? We relate to your shows because we've had similar situations happen to us. Will you help? And we think Breaking Homicide is a start to answering those calls for help. Now in terms of the Honolulu Strangler, what was it about that case that got you to want to Well, it's the it first and I believe only serial homicide case in Hawaii. No. Um, there may have been another one, but this is kind of the first one. It was unsolved. And uh, it affected that community significantly, and it was never solved. Interestingly, it came up on the heels or the time period of the Green River killing case, which was in Seattle and the Pacific Northwest. But, um, you know, paradise, a place that you're supposed to go to to feel safe. And here you have, you know, a number of people that have turned up dead, murdered. 
and it needed to be answered. I've done a lot of work in Hawaii throughout the years. I have family there, um, and I have friends that worked at the police department, one of whom I reached out to. Because the police didn't cooperate in terms of this case. Oh, I, really I wouldn't say that. I'd well, say the police were very they cooperative. They didn't give you files, though. They didn't give That's us files, I but I will say, and it didn't make the episode, but we actually did sit down with the chief of the active chief of police in no. the Honolulu Police Department, and she was amazing, and she told us some things that we kind of known from our own investigation, but she basically said to us, hey, listen, like, like all the departments said, hey, listen, this is an open investigation. We can't divulge information to anyone. No. However, if you have something that's compelling that may lead us in a certain direction that could help close this, we're all ears, as they should be. So uh, I think as far as openness, nobody ever obstructed our ability nope. to investigate no. in any of the cases, yeah, no, no, no. and that's all you can ask for. And, you know, I had uh, several friends that, uh, that I've known through the years, Honolulu Police Department, no. former detectives, they were fantastic, yeah. and they opened up as much as they could. I felt like you know we got the aloha spirit as yeah. we were doing our investigation there. They wanted answers, and it's not just the families of the victims that suffer with this being unresolved and not having the questions answered, but it's, as you'll see, the detectives themselves carry this burden yeah. of wanting to be able to, to share to, this information. Yeah. And you worked with Peter Carlisle, that's his name, correct? Yeah, right. Peter Carlisle. And you and him come up with the conclusion of who you believe to have done it, who is also passed away. Well, yeah, what we, did, we didn't even like? come up to that conclusion collectively. Yeah. We wanted the answers to certain hard questions. And, and I'll be honest, going into it, I had spoken to Chris off camera and said, this guy, he was a politician. He was the mayor of Honolulu for a while. He's going to be polished. He's going to give us the politically correct answer. He's not going to say anything. And then we asked the, the big question, do you think this individual did it? And he looked us right in the face and said yes. And you could see the emotion and, and he felt from that, knowing that he wasn't able to, to really put the nail in the coffin, so to speak, on this case. But I was so impressed with his candor and the, his willingness to go on camera and say what he did because I, I can tell you right now, a lot of the families involved with this, uh, you know, the victims' no. families, I think they'll really respect that. I really, really do. He didn't pull any punches. He no. was direct. He didn't equivocate. It was, here's what I think, and it was very emotional. Our uh, primary homicide investigator who pursued this initially had the original task no. force. Similarly, fantastic human being, but he had been carrying the weight of this for all these you years. See that, yeah. 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 Um, in terms of re-examining these cases, how troubling is it to you that these cases are unsolved? And these cases back then, they weren't, I guess, investigated the same way you guys are looking into it. it For the Honolulu case, I think Derek, you said, I don't think this case will ever be classified as cold. Uh, closed. Solved. Well, well the, re the reason I would say that is because in this situation, our, our primary person of interest is deceased. Yeah. So the bottom line is this, you can't consider a case closed because there's never going to be a conviction. But as far as it being solved with, with, with the conclusion of the show and the, the chance that we gave Detective Louis Souza to speak to one of the victim's brothers and actually tell him right out who did it, why he thought he did it, I could tell from the reaction. We wanted to give him that respect and let him do it because he'd been wanting yeah. to do it for years. And you could tell by uh, Regina Sakamoto's brother's reaction that was what he's been waiting for Pretty all this time. So, And I said to him, hey, listen, this case may never be classified as closed, but in our opinion, it's solved. Yeah. And we wanted him to have his you know, his day and his opportunity to do that. This is a man that worked very hard, Louis Souza, yeah, to correct. get answers. Um, there's a misunderstanding sometimes that law enforcement isn't motivated to resolve these cases. No, and while in some cases that, that may be, I haven't seen it yet in any of ours, these, these professionals want these cases solved. And sometimes there's an impasse because of technology a lot of times it's because people aren't coming forward. Maybe at the time they didn't think their information was important. Um, and, you know, going in and, you know, getting a fresh perspective, talking to people anew, re-examining crime scenes and data fresh, that ends up, you know, kind of uncovering things that need to be uncovered. Obviously, the Michelle Norris case was personal to you. It mm -hmm. became personal for you. Right. How do you separate that? Well, when we say personal, when I say personal, yeah. I mean that I'm allowing myself to feel and empathize with the experience you know, of the losses that these people, Julie, Nate, Billy, the community, have experienced. And I don't think that that should necessarily cloud your objectivity. Yeah. In fact, it should enhance your objectivity because what you're doing is saying, I am now even more motivated, yeah. apart from this being some anonymous 
case number and a file someplace. This is a human being yeah. um, who meant something to all these people who should not be forgotten, and we owe it to the community and especially to this family to get answers. So to make it personal means I'm not going to distance myself from my responsibility to do the best job that I can, and I'm not interested in getting it wrong. Right. You say, I, you guys don't have tunnel vision. Like, you don't go into no. it. No, when it, I want the truth. truth. I want the truth. Yeah. Now, when it comes to trying to decipher fact from fiction, you're not, you're not swayed by your emotions, but what we're saying is you're raising the level of expectation. So if this were someone I cared about, if it involved me, what type of investigation would I want the, these detectives to conduct? How far would I want them to go? Yeah. Am I all in? Yeah, yeah. am I all in? And, and that's when you put that level of expectation you on be, yourself, but... you do. And when yeah. you put that level of expectation as if it was my daughter or my son or my wife, what would I do? What lengths would I go to within the confines of the law? You go all the way, and, and that's what we try to do for these families. Now, in terms of uh, the season finale, the Michelle O'Keefe case, can you talk yeah. about that and how it was first presented to you in... You know, it's funny because the show is called Breaking Homicide, right? But you also have to remember that there, there are cases where people are wrongfully convicted of, of a crime that they didn't commit. And in this situation, you have, a, you have a, an individual who did 11 years in prison and was ultimately found factually innocent. So what we always look at it as, and all investigators should look at it this way, is I'd rather see 100 guilty men go free than one innocent man go to jail for something he didn't do. So there's two stories here. There's two real great stories about someone who, there's two victims here. You have an individual who did 11 years in prison for something he didn't do, and you have someone who is still walking the streets today who committed a heinous act. And we're trying to bring light to both situations because there are, are still a lot of people out there who believe this individual was found factually innocent is guilty. So we look into that as, as well as the other avenues as, as far as who may have possibly done it. The Michelle O'Keefe story has so many important aspects to it, not the least of which is making sure you get it right yeah. and that there's enough integrity within the system to admit when it's made a mistake and now you have a problem of who did it. And that's what we investigate and delve into. What other cases out there would you want to re-examine? Something that you've uh, oh my gosh. come we, across over the years that you've we, said. We've had so many different cases that have been presented to us okay. by um, individuals across our country. There are thousands of unsolved cases. And part of what we want to accomplish in this series, in our efforts, is to inspire those whose cases we may not take no. to not give up and to still have hope. I've got a couple in mind. There's one in Ohio that I'm very much uh, into, yeah. as is Derek. Can you talk about it? Um, no, no, I don't yeah. want to. Yeah, because <laughs> we want to solve it. We want to yeah. solve it. And then there's one here in Los Angeles that I'm actually very interested in, in which a boy's body was found in a chimney many years ago um, after he'd been murdered. And I'm very interested in that case as well. Right. But like he said, he, he nailed it. You know, the, the, the main focus here is to know we're going to take the cases as far as we can. We also want you, the viewers, to know that society today allows for you to have a voice. And as far as we're going to take it, you can take it even further. You have a voice. If you see something, say something. And if you feel that there's an injustice here or someone may, you know, be looked, should be looked into further, use that voice. There are movements happening every day for people that really stand behind certain causes. Let's get together and do that. Let's hold the judicial system accountable. And also understand that if you have something that you've been personally affected by, no matter how many years has passed, there's always a chance that it could be solved. And people like us are out there. It's not just me and him. And, and you never know. We may be coming or calling you next. Now, are there any updates you can provide on some of these cases that you can share? So, so every case that we work, we can complete a letter. We turn it over to the police yep. department. In some cases, we show them the footage prior to it. And at that point, it goes from being our investigation to their investigation because it's a partnership. It's a collaboration. And we want to solve these cases. And those are the individuals who have the opportunity to do that. So we are not going to divulge what we know now for the integrity of the case. But okay. if there's an update, if or when there's an arrest in any of these cases, we will 100% make sure that everyone knows uh, the status of that investigation. Breaking Homicide Final Theory at ID Go yeah. um, is the place to get those kinds of updates. But I'll tell you this. Okay. Um, we've done a number of these interviews, and after one of the first interviews we did, Derek gets a text from somebody watching that show that had additional information about our first case. And that has been turned over. So what I'll tell you is, while we take these investigations forward, that momentum has been propped up and accelerated by other people out there watching this that have actually done the right thing and called out. Before we go, is there anything you want to say? No, I just I, I hope people check out the show. And again, if you have something that could help the case go further, 
Use your voice. Let's make it a movement. Let's get these cases solved for these individuals. That's what it's about. A lot of shows you watch out there, there's already an ending. You're just watching the show and there's a conclusion. That's not always going to be the case in this. It's up to you to get there, and we're going to help as much as we can, but let's give these families the justice they deserve. You are part of this, and it's partnerships that solve cases today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you.